Each and every month, we put together these events at Erie Street, which has been amazing. Great food, great people, easy valet, um, in order to be able to provide just great content for people that are interested in various topics. So in January, we had Dr. Chris Corner. He wrote a book, Never Hire a Bad Salesman, How to Test for Drive Among Salespeople. That was incredible. Last month, we had Pangea Properties. We had the uh, principals at Cast Management. We had Milan Rubenstein from Windy City Real Estate and Igor Zizhen, How to Buy Multifamily. That was an amazing time. Today, I'm really, really happy uh, because the people that are here are just amazing people as well. They are, are very reputable, um, highly uh, uh, efficient developers in our city, this beautiful city, city of ours. They're, they're just building great property. The best thing is I'm an OCD clean freak. So like when I'm driving down the streets, when I see a newer home being built, I love it. It just scratches my OCD and I'm like, oh, there's a beautiful building going up. The old one is going down and it's just beautifying our city. And these guys are all a part of it. Um, so. Essentially, the, the agenda for the day is we're going to ask a lot of specific questions to these, these wonderful people. It's very open floor plan. Please ask as many questions as you like to help you understand about development. They're going to share some of their vulnerabilities or struggles as they came up in development. I'm going to moderate it, and if you have questions, just raise your hand. We're going to pass the microphone around. Food's going to come out while you guys are eating. Eat a lot. Um, there's some drinks as well. Um, and have a great time. So without, without further ado, I want to just introduce some of these, these awesome people here. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, it means a lot. First person is Brian Goldberg from LG Construction and Development. Um, LG is a full service design build, general contracting development firm. Many of you guys have heard of them. Um, Brian is a partner there. He basically oversees all the construction operations, um, including new project budgeting, development, uh, conceptualization, hard word to say, but you get the point, <laughs> and production. He successfully competed over $80 million in real estate, so we're very happy he's here. Next up is one of my favorite people in the world, a man that I consider a mentor, um, Gary Benson. He showed me a great time at Chicago Yacht Club. We both love to smoke cigars. So um, Gary has over 30 years of residential real estate experience uh, in condo conversion and new developments around the country. Every time I meet with him, what I love is that he's very in, in, in tune with statistics and data, and he explains it to me, and it's just very exciting when the market is going, so I'm excited to hear that from him as well. Next is Jeff Benick, uh, great man. He founded, uh, uh, co he's a co-principal of Lexington Homes. He founded in 1973, very influential home builder in Chicago throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, has built more homes than anyone in Chicago, about 40,000 or more, I believe, so a lot of homes. Um, then is my friend Dan Popovich, uh, great family. His brother and his dad are here as well, Roman and Roman Jr. Right? So they are, are owner of Panoptic Group. Amazing developments. They're very well known in Westtown, Bucktown, Wicker Park, and Lincoln Park. Uh, a lot of their developments are LEED certified. Um, when I met with them, their presentation as far as the energy efficiency of their properties is just incredible. So very happy to have you guys here. What we're going to do, we have a microphone. I'd like you guys just to spend a couple minutes and just pass it down. Tell us a little more about yourselves, your, come your background in development. Um, and then we'll open up for some of my moderations for you guys. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Amir. Appreciate being here and a lot of familiar faces, which is pretty cool. Um, glad we all made it through the really bad times. Now we can all complain about what we're doing now. <laughs> just working too hard. Um, we are we just celebrated our 10th anniversary. We started basically doing high-end single, uh, single family homes. And we've grown quite a bit. The market's been very, very good to us. A lot of great clients, a lot of great agents, a lot of you guys in the room. So thank you. Um, you know, this year we're bringing online about 100 and, uh, 120 apartments. Uh, we're doing a bunch of condo projects. We have a really cool one coming up here, uh, 41 really high-end condos in River North. Um, the market's become incredibly strong. A lot of people have concerns about financing and things, but Amir can tell you, people, people can get loans now, which is great. They just need to be qualified. Have a job. And have a, they just need to have a job. Uh, it's really great. You know, we have a bunch of pre-sales. Um, we're really excited about, about everything that's going on, and, and to see the city vibrant again is really, it's pretty awesome. Nice. Thank you again, Amir, for having us. Uh, my name is Gary Benson, as he had pointed out. I'm a principal with EMS Garrison. EMS Garrison is a national sales and marketing company that provides product development and positioning services to our clients. Uh, which I'd like to have right here. <laughs> um, we are operated in 26 different states. We have probably about a four, four and a half billion dollar past portfolio. Currently we're working in three states, uh, Michigan, 
which is seeing a whole new rebirth um, in Texas, and uh, we're also doing a project in Chicago that's going to be announced uh, shortly for, for a high-end luxury deal. Jeff? I'm Jeff Bennick. I'm a principal with Lexington Homes. Uh, in two or three different various entities, we were, we've been pretty much the, the largest local private home builder in the Chicago area throughout the last 40 years. Concord Homes is another one of our former entities. Um, and we've done, uh, we've built pretty much every type of uh, dwelling type that you can imagine between high rise and low rise and elevator, non elevator, city suburbs. And now we're, you know, we've, we're concentrating our efforts on, on the city and close in suburbs now, which is kind of a niche that we think we have that nobody else really, really can do it the same way that we can. So that's what we're doing now. Hi, my name is Bogdan Popovich. Um, our family has been developing since 98. Uh, we specialized in high-end single-family homes. In 2011, we've, as of uh, coming out of the recession, decided that sustainability and efficiency was important, and we fully committed, rebranded, refocused on that. Um, right now, our homes are LEED certified um, gold or better. We're actually looking at some that are going to be platinum. And we have a good mix between single families, multi-units, uh, and uh, the next, uh, our ultimate goal is to really develop homes that are net zero, which means they're fully off the grid, fully self-sufficient, and basically zero bills for our buyers. Uh, the second priority is also um, uh, health, uh, healthy living. So we combine a lot of uh, high-tech features such as HEPA filters, energy recovery ventilators, um, UV lamps, and um, air purifications and things like that. And, so we're not only focused on um, green building, but more importantly on efficiency and healthy living. Nice. I guess my first question for everyone is, t tell us about your first development, how long that was, what you experienced, what you learned, what success you had, and be honest. <laughs> and what happened with the second and third development, when you started to make some money, when you lost some money, all those fun, fun stories. So with you, Brian. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> man, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I actually started in 1999, so we did a single family home and uh, figured out the hard way what happens when you go over budget and the bank's not going to loan you anymore to finish the house. Um, that was a fun project, but ultimately we sold it, made some good money, and um, out of that project got a lot of referrals to just build for people. Um, so it was really an opportunity, um, and that's really what carried us through the really bad market. We kind of slowed down development, but we've grown our construction arm to be pretty sizable. Um, we're doing a lot of apartments and condos for other developers as well. Um, we still do custom single families, which we really love doing, and uh, you know that's it, it, it all just kind of grew from that one project. It's good. Is that an okay answer? Yeah, I'm gonna get more juice here later, though. Okay, Gary. Um, there's an old phrase that uh, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want, uh, and we've had a lot of different experiences working for clients across the country. Um, I started. Uh, the predecessor to EMS Garrison was called Garrison Partners. And um, at, at that time, we started with a small project in 1994, um, which was uh, called New Biscuit Lofts in Evanston. And it was trashed by the market research teams and almost didn't, didn't, didn't happen because they couldn't see the history of a successful development in Southwest Evanston. <laughs> Uh, but through a process that we enact on all of our developments, we were able to establish some credibility and momentum and overcome the objections and sold out the project in six months. Well, I'm not sure if I have a right way to answer the question. I mean, Lexington's very first project was a project called Lexington Green in Schaumburg in 1973. I actually was not with the company yet. Um, but we've had a couple different entities, uh, I should say, uh, iterations of, of Lexington and Concord. So maybe I'll talk about our first, build, our first development at this, in this phase, which was in uh, 2007 in Wheeling, when we regrouped and took the Lexington name back after selling Concord Homes to Lennar. And um, we opened up with a couple communities and got ourselves all set. And then, you know, you know what, hit the fan. And then we worked our way through these last these, these projects. So what we really I have to say, after being in the business for 30 years, I probably learned more in those first three or four starting those communities right in the, heath, in the teeth of the recession than I have since or before. So as much as that was painful, and it was painful, um, you know, we'll probably, uh, we see benefits from that experience that we're, that we're living now. I mean, efficiency probably being the, the chief among them. 
So, you know, going forward, our, like any developer that has the good fortune of still being in business or being in business today, you know, we're dipping our toes in the water fairly cautiously, but feeling more and more confident as, as months go on. So. I was very fortunate to get started very early. I would say my first project's more so my father's project. I just kind of ran it. I started at 19. Um, we, we lost about six months of uh, time with a zoning issue. Uh, that the, we had to work out with the alderman, and for me it was just a really big learning experience because at the time I was still going to school and building, so um, it, it was tough, but it was also a very, very good experience. I actually picked up Polish in the process. <laughs> I never spoke Polish before that, but <laughs> that came out as a benefit. As uh, By the time I was done with the project, I was fairly okay. It's speaking and I understand in Polish uh, very well at that point. So, yeah, it was a three unit in uh, Humble Park actually, and Mozart. Nice, nice, so you can be bilingual if you get into development, you learn a different language. Yeah, Maria? <laughs> so what did you guys do in 2008, 2009, when everything hit the fan, there was no development going on? What were you guys working on? Were you guys actually developing? Were you doing smaller scale projects? Did you start uh, getting into different endeavors? What were, you th what were we getting into? How come I always have to be the first one to answer the question? <laughs> it's too much pressure. Um, we had some developments going. Luckily, we had a few uh, high-end single-family homes that we did sell. It, we sold them a little less than we wanted to, but we still did fine. Um, we had a townhome project that we actually phased and only built a few as we were selling them, and we offered to these buyers an unbelievable amount of customization, which most developers don't do for a reason, because uh, it's really hard. It uh, doesn't really cost much more, but you just have to spend a lot of time and attention. Every home becomes a custom home, so um, you know, 11 townhomes at Diversity and Lakewood. And the rest of it was uh, construction for others. So we did The Girl and the Goat. Uh, it was one of our first larger scale restaurants. And that really tied into a lot of future work in different sectors and high-end retail and, and even like landlord build-outs and stuff like that, which really, it helped a lot. So you know, just being a part of the service industry, I, I, so to speak, is that's what you call general contracting. You know, we believe it's a service, so that's what helps. So, so if we need a reservation, and go on the go, we call you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Um, in 2008, um, let's see, we, we saw the market starting to, to, to crater in the spring of 2006. We had just been hired to take over 1,200 units in three, in four cities in, in Tampa. And at that time, Florida had always been the forerunner to most collapses. So when we saw that, we started uh, contracting our organization uh, in 2006. Uh, 2007, you know, as we all know, was the beginning of the, of the end. We thought, oh, yeah, a couple more years, we'll work our way through this, you know, 10 years later. Um, but from our business model, uh, we did okay because we were consultants and we went to work for our lenders because our clients no longer, no longer had the project and the lenders were owners in possession. So we, we made it through that and still do a lot of consulting on that basis, uh, some receivership work, uh, working on behalf of lenders or working on behalf of equity, part, equity providers more often than not. Well, um, we had been, uh, as I said before, setting up this entity in 06, 07, and we got our first three communities all set to go, which were, as I said, Wheeling, Des Plaines, and in Bridgeport, in the city here. Got everything all teed up, ready to go, got our financing in place, and then, you know, the thing hit the wall. And we said to ourselves, though, we kept mushing forward. We said, how, you know, we've been through all these recessions before, four or five as a group. And how long can these things last? You know, 18 so, months? How long? Who knew? Who knew? Well, 18 months turned into 24, turned into three years, turned into four years. And 95% of other builders in our situation would have walked away and left these things you know, high and dry. A lot of subdivisions got abandoned. We didn't because we wanted to have life after. So we took all the pain and the lumps and, and you know, brought money to most of our closings. And so now you know, we're, uh, you know, we're able to get our financing again and there's life after. But it wasn't with lots and lots of pain. And as far as we're concerned, this recession ended just, or, or I should say the downturn, ended just in time. I mean, just in time. Another year would have been tougher. So, but hopefully that's behind us. Well, the recession for us was very difficult. Um, we just transitioned to very large projects, and 
uh, when the recession hit, the financing went away, and so we, we ended up scrambling. Uh, we transitioned to rehabs and flips, so we did, uh, we started doing rehab, buying two units, four units, uh, finishing them and, and uh, selling them off, and we were able to leverage our relationships with banks to acquire properties and complete uh, failed projects, so that will help us, uh, it really helped us get through the most difficult times. Um, I think the benefit of the recession was that it really refocused and made you think about development and efficiency and things like that. And so the company that came out of it, uh, I think, came out a lot stronger because of it. Yeah, I'm going to say one more thing. I realize I didn't answer the question totally. What did we do to survive during this unexpected downturn? Because, like I said, we were pregnant, then we gave birth, and we had these, these three children that we were raising, and they were obviously going off to the Audi home or whatever happens when the kids start getting older. So what did we do? We are, as those of you know who Lexington and Concord are and were, we are a, a pure production builder that we're doing 1,000, 1,200 units a year, and we had the whole system down to a real, effective, exacting format. So now you come forward and you have this recession hit, and what are we doing? We were doing whatever people wanted to do in these homes. We made custom changes in townhomes that I never dreamt we would do. And in fact, when things started to get better, it was tough for me to wean the salesperson, the salespeople off, you know, saying yes to these things. Now we're pretty much back to we won't move things and change things that they want unless it's within our, our, our scope of, of options. But uh, it was, <laughs> even coming back off that was a bit of a transition. But that's what we did. We did whatever you want to heliport in your backyard, we'll do it. <laughs> so. nice. What have you guys seen, the difference from the, in the buyer market, pre-boom, post-boom? What has been the difference between the buyer market, pre-recession, post-recession? Well, the current buyers have jobs, uh, and that was in, in, in the pre-recession. You know, we were looking at people that were uh, buying homes and having debt ratios in excess of 50%. Uh, they were the liar, they were the liar loans. Uh, today, you know, I was speaking in, in Vegas at the Home Builder Show this year, and this year was all about, you know, when are the millenniums coming? Uh, our household formations are still down. Uh, the millennials haven't come to the market the way we had anticipated. Um, but I don't think we've lost a nation of, of home ownership. Uh, we did a survey at the NAHB where we surveyed 3,200 uh, individuals between 18 and 35. 29% already had homes uh, that, were, that they were occupying as an ownership. And the other 97% said that home ownership was in their long-term goals. Uh, you know, our buyer pool, we, we've always kind of focused on the higher end product. So what we are seeing is our, obviously, people having jobs. Um, but they are thinking more about uh, things that they didn't before. You could you know, look at any condo and they'd put upgrades and all kinds of crazy stuff and, and there are a lot of the units that, that are coming on the market now that are weird bachelor patty kind of places with hot tub in the middle of the living room and that kind of stuff. I think people are a lot more cautious to do that because they're thinking now about resale and they're saying, worst case, what if I have to dump it? What happens next year if the market kind of turns back a little bit? How much am I paying for this? And do I have the right bathroom and bedroom count? So they're consulting their agents a little bit more rather than just buying because everybody's in line trying to get you know, a, a unit at Silver Tower or whatever. They sold 100 units or whatever ridiculous number in a weekend. I don't really think it's like that anymore. I think people are just more cautious. Uh, it's still fresh in their minds. Well, I, I see a plethora of differences in every area of what we do between pre-recession and post-recession. From a buyer's standpoint, you know, we certainly don't have the traffic that we did, you know, whereas a community might have averaged 40 to 50 in a, in a week, uh, between week and weekend. Now you might see 8 to 12 or 15. I think the difference is you had a lot of tire kickers back then. You had a lot of, you know, a lot of investors, obviously. Today, I get the sense that most of the people that are out looking are in the market to buy. They're just no, there's no urgency. And they're, you know, they don't have to do it today, and they're going to look and see everything and make sure they make the right decision. And I do see some more leaning on brokers than, than the old days. But uh, that, that's, that's probably the biggest difference I see in the, in the buyers. And from a, from, a, from a development standpoint, sales and marketing standpoint, I think you've got to know, you know, in the old days, as, as, as guys who would hire sales forces and manage sales forces, which we did in the, in, in all, throughout all, all those years, we were always looking for closers, closers, closers. And I think today my dip difference is, is that that's almost secondary. They have to have a closing ethic, but they've got to understand how to get them to that point. And if you don't understand, understand probing and 
helping them to understand what they're trying to find and understanding what they're looking for and that whole process and you're not going to get them on paper. That's from a sales standpoint. From a builder standpoint, I think there's a lot of things that are different. A lot of things that we were able to do and succeed in spite of what we were doing. I mean, you know, our margins were so good and the sales were so good and, you know, you didn't have to have all top-notch salespeople. You didn't have to be exactly on the market with, with your product. You didn't have to, uh, you know, you had to deliver a good product, but, you know, if there were issues, you could fix them and, and bury them under the radar screen because you had such strong margins. I think today, you know, you could buy a piece of ground that wasn't as good in terms of its location or its site, but you could offset that with pricing if you were able to buy it right. Today, I think nothing... You have to do everything right. You know, there isn't a lot that's going to go under the radar screen. You've got to buy the right location. You've got to buy your, 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 uh, your, your materials correctly. You've got to sell them right. You've got to market it right. And if you don't do any of these things, you know, you're going you're gonna to be left in the dust. But if you can, keep things in perspective, not go get, get, you know, get too aggressive, and you do all the things correctly, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity. Well, I think before the recession, most um, our particular product where we were special in, in very luxury uh, and custom-built homes. People, we saw that people spent mo a lot of money on upgrades to get the customizations and, and things that they wanted. After the recession, I think the priorities for the buyers changed, and more importantly, the buyer market changed from you know high-end luxury to the affordable range, which gave rise to homes like SmartTech, and people were really looking for bang for the buck and efficiency. They weren't looking for the finishes and, and things like that. They just wanted to buy a good built affordable home. I think a lot of developers started also to cut corners to meet the low cost uh, building, to meet the lower sales prices. So I think, in my opinion, the quality of the homes kind of in that period were degraded <coughs> because of you know, the changing market. Um, what we're seeing now is that that market is coming back. Lending is coming back. The buyers have the security and the capital to now afford the homes again, and they're they're much smarter about it. As Brian mentioned, you know they're thinking about resale and things like that. But now they they want those um, premium things and customization again. And our last couple of homes, um, <coughs> against our will, ended up being customized as well because buyers wanted to do those special things to have the um, to to inject the, their own personality into the home. So we're seeing, I think, that market, it, it, the buyer's market is being shifted back into the premium and the luxury markets, and I, I think those markets will continue to flourish for at least a couple more years. Gary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this to you, and I'd like to hear the rest of you guys. So how are you seeing with, with the potential of a lot of millennials in the, in the next three to five years, how are developments being geared or programmed to attract more millennials? Um, you know, it's a great question. You see the trend towards the sale product is going to be larger units. And we're really more, you know, most of the condo projects right now that you'll see, at least on the north side, um, are favoring like the 2,000 square foot and up range. Um, it, it just seems to be the, the, the market right now for like the wealthier millennials, the ones with parents have a lot of money, young families, and then of course the, uh, what do we call them? The, the baby boomers or the, the one after that? What is it? All the people, the, the empty nesters, Gen right? X. Empty Gen nesters. X. Gen X, sure. Moving back from uh, Winnetka and Wilmette and Highland Park and Deerfield, um, 4,000 square foot, 5,000 square foot single family. They're selling. They're not going to downgrade to like a 1,300 square foot condo. You know, the, the wife will kill the husband or the husband will kill the wife. I don't know what happens first. But um, a lot of these apartment projects, I think, are what are being, you know, taken up really quickly by these millennials. And I think that younger kids are used to come out of college, uh, budgets are tight, they still have student loans, and I think they're gonna wanna and be okay with a three or four or 500 square foot uh, apartment. And this is becoming huge in New York and, and San Fran and Chicago's trying to catch up and the city doesn't like them, but this micro unit concept is, is huge right now. And I think if, if the kid's willing to live in a shoebox and spend 12 or 13 or 1400 bucks a month instead of having to split a $3,000 a month two bedroom, um, they're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, the, you mentioned the micro units. Uh, back to the home builder show was the first time I saw the, the micro single family homes. These were 800 to 1,000 square foot single families uh, with carports. Uh, and they were being put up at about $70 a foot new construction, you know, sticks and, sticks and bricks. and. It was really amazing, uh, and it was 100% geared to the millennials, uh, which was the first time I had seen that type of that type of new product. 
Jeff, you, you're doing that market. Uh, whatever we can. I mean, you know, yeah, this, those, what, we, what we tabbed as first-time home buyers in the old days, I mean, that, that buyer is now about six, seven years older. I mean, I don't remember. I don't think we've had many buyers in their 20s who have purchased that I can think of in the last five years. And that used to represent 20% of our market, where, you know, people under 30. You know, now most of the first-timers I see are 32, 33, 35, you know. And obviously the rental market is geared up as well because they're all renting. And I don't know, you know, at the end of the day, how much we're going to be able to do in terms of designing product to bring that market back. I think it's more a function of, you know, a lot of them are saddled with debt and they're not 100% you know, in a position to take on a, you know, a, a house yet. Maybe they're not feeling the confidence in their own jobs. Maybe some of them are still working at jobs that are less than what their schooling sent them out at. at and, you know, I think that's a big part of why we've seen that, that buyer go away. And I think as you see that part of the market improve, you know, where the jobs are coming more in line with, you know, uh, that level, then you might see that, that start to change. But I think it's been more of a cultural shift that might take a while to, to see come back. So in my mind, I don't see a big 20-something barrage anytime real soon. And again, that's, I think the rental market is also geared up as well because that's, that's where they're going. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is that there's a shift back into the cities, as Brian mentioned. Most people that were considering buying homes in the suburbs are now considering buying homes in the city. They want to be closer to work. They don't want to lose time traveling back and forth. Um, and also the priority of homes. People don't want to, they, they no longer want the big home. They want, you know, the right size home to, for the family. They don't want to take care of more than they need to. And the other thing I think we're seeing is a shift in technology. Um, especially with the advent of you know mobile phones and, and people want connectivity, they want to be, have control, the security and the access to the homes and functionality. And they, they, what we're seeing is they really want the home to be smart. Um, you know, there's a big boom in the Internet of Things, and what that means is that essentially everything is going to be connected so one way to the or another to the Internet, <clears throat> and they want to have access to it. You, you know, you want to get home. And you want the home to adjust itself around you without you having to think about what to do. You know, your temperature, maybe play your favorite music, um, follow you with lights and, and things like that. So I think the uh, influx of technology is going to be very important in the a, in a future homes um, because that's kind of those age groups are, are they just grew up in it and they, they expect it to be part of their life. <coughs> So what are you guys' feelings about the uh, for sale market versus the rental market? Do you see some of these rental buildings converting? Is it a threat to your business? Well, uh, collectively, my partner and I have probably done 4,000 units of conversion under our own portfolio. Uh, the conversions haven't been occurring to date because properties are selling at sub four caps. Uh, we bid on a project recently, and we thought we were at the top of the market, and we were $15 million off the cut, uh, and it went for a sub four. You can't make a conversion happen when you're, at, when you're buying at sub fours, uh, and I think that'll continue to happen until uh, the first new construction rental deal doesn't uh, stabilize quickly enough, and then when they start to drop their rents, the, you know, we've got, we started off with A, Bs, and Cs. Now we have luxury A, B, and C. And when the luxury delivers and can't fulfill its, its absorption needs, they're going to drop their prices down to the A's. And then the A's, because renters are fickle and will move out to the luxury product, the A's will have no place to go. Uh, and they've been purchased at sub four caps, and the only way out is to convert. Uh, and I think we'd hope that that would start uh, this year but I think you're really going to start to see it as Chicago delivers the next 6,000 units. There, you know, listen, we've all been in this business long enough that everything goes in cycle. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, I sat in front of the uh, National Multifamily Housing Council, and I was there to talk about condominiums, and they were all like, oh, no, no, no condos. All we do is rentals. All we do is rentals. Well, the next year, they're, they're on the panel with me talking about condos because the market had shifted, and the rentals weren't, weren't succeeding, and they were talking about 300% IRRs. You know, they said, this is great. Five years later, oh my God, we're never going to do another condominium in our lives. <laughs> Back to rentals. So it's a cycle, and this cycle is going to run like all of them. And mm -hmm. you're going to start to see conversions uh, come back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. What he said. <laughs> that, was a great, that was a great answer. Um, here's the catch, I think. 
we can build a nice, luxurious condominium building and do 2,200, 3,000 square foot, 3,500 square foot, and get top dollar. And you'll even see Wicker Park in Bucktown, a bunch of the developers here, guys are selling now 450, $500 a square foot for a decent size two and three, and even four bedrooms, outdoor space, all that kind of stuff. The catch is, how do you convert a 200, 300 unit, you know, average size four or 500 square foot apartment building that has maybe a one to three parking ratio, which is what everybody's building, back to condos. Like how do you sell a condo with no parking space that has a, you know, a pretty sizable assessment that's gonna come with it? Um, you know, how do you price that and, and where's the market for that? So we're gonna see some of these apartment buildings in certain areas, it's gonna be a really interesting kind of thing to watch over the next five to 10 years. And maybe the model sticks, you know, for the guys is a, is a, is a reasonable priced uh, three or 400 square foot unit, or maybe they start getting converted, you know, like big time. You got them and, you know, three units become one, but it'll be really interesting to watch. Uh, well, Gary pretty much hit it on the head, I think, when he talked about what's going on with the conversion rate of market now and going forward. What I thought was interesting, you know, in 2010, thereabouts, when we saw the rents going crazy uh, in A, B, A and B buildings, we always thought, you know, well, this will help get the, you know, the for sale market back as soon as these, as, as these rents keep, crawling, keep, keep, keep raising. And they have kept going up, and that didn't seem to have the effect <laughs> that we're waiting for that to happen. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see, you know, I, I, you know, to see some of these newer buildings, you know, if they convert, I mean, you know, th these buildings that have got amenities up, you know, at such high end nowadays, you know, it'll be interesting to see if, in, if in fact, those ever convert. You know, some developers will build a rental building with the intention of converting down the road. I don't see any of these buildings that have come out of the ground in the last couple of years, though, that way. These seem, seem more like high amenity, you know, like the, you know, the um, uh, a K2 is a typical building to me, like what you see coming up out of the ground over the last four or five years, um, you know, amenities like crazy. So, um, yeah, at some point, the whole thing will start to shift back, and you'll see conversions of some of these buildings start to happen. Um, you know, a rental building typically needs more units than a condo building, you know, when you look at numbers. So that's another factor, and a lot of these buildings are so big, these rental buildings that are coming out as well. So, you know, I'm not sure I see as many of the newer buildings converting as I do maybe seeing some of these older buildings that are 10, 15, 20 years old starting to convert, you know, at some point down the road. But at this point, it doesn't seem like it's tipping in that direction. But it will. I think the rental versus condo really follows uh, two things, market conditions and lending conditions. So when uh, the market's down and lending's difficult, um, there's a much more focus on rental uh, for the simple reason that buyers don't know how, what to expect out of the future. Rental is, is, is a safer bet. Um, now that the uh, markets come back, lending's back, I think there's going to be a larger focus into the condominium markets, and I think some of the current buildings that are rentals are going to be finished up, and a lot more of the builders and developers are going to start looking, at least in the near future, into the condo versus the rental. It'll also be interesting to see what happens later this year when the Fed raises rates, interest rates, which is going to happen. It's going to happen, so, and it has to happen. It'll be interesting to see how things shift when that happens. You know, the only thing I've noticed is that you can, I had one client once say to me, I never met a real estate deal that I couldn't make money at given enough time. <laughs> and to that end, you know, you can make any real estate deal work on a 15-year pro forma. <laughs> and, and that's what, that's what's the, the, uh, the institutional money and the pension fund money is, is doing. They're doing 15-year pro formas and you can buy it at a sub three cap. And as long as that's still occurring, and as long as that there's that influx of money out there, there's not going to be conversions, and there's not going to be new construction condos. And there's been one high-rise condo in Chicago that started last year by CMK, and they're about to deliver. And from what I understand, they're only at about 25%, you know, pre-sold. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to that project and uh, and what happens going forward. The lenders aren't lending on the condos to speak of other than, you know, 70% loan to value is the numbers that I'm seeing, you know, maybe sometimes 80% depending on the sponsor. You might be able to. You can get a 90. Oh yeah. You can do 105. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was gonna ask you guys that, uh, how do, when you guys an analyze your deals, how much effect does the stock market, the bond market, interest rates impact your decision making when working on a large scale project? It's equity. It's all about equity. You know, uh, 
from our standpoint, you know, in some cases we get involved with our clients, helping them arrange for, for mezzanine or debt or, or equity and a combination thereof. But, you know, like Jeff said, the rates are going to be going up. <coughs> And when those, when those happen, those deals that traded at the sub fours and sub threes, they're going to go upside down, you know? No, I, I agree. I mean, it's, um, again, what he said. It was nice to give you the answer first. Um, you know, it doesn't affect us really directly. I mean, a lot of the people that buy the high-end product, you know, they're not as sensitive to market fluctuations. And the market's really strong right now, all-time highs and all that kind of stuff, which is good for everybody. Um, so outside of a huge downturn in the stock markets, I don't think it's going to affect as much. I think Gary's right. It's more on the institutional side. Um, from a development aspect, how much does it cost to finance a project? And how much are these pension funds going to make outside of, you know, if they're going to buy a, a building, when he says a three cap, that means they're going to make about 3% on the gross purchase, which is weak, but they can factor in a 3 or 4% annual increase. Um, and as rates go up, that's going to basically flip the switch and, and that 3% isn't really going to be attractive or profitable anymore. Yeah. Tell us a little about marketing, guys. Uh, how, do you, how much intel analysis do you lean on when you're looking at development from a marketing standpoint? Do you do any of that? And if so, what type of an analysis and intel do you, do you lean on? Well, a lot. You know, and it's funny because dovetailing on the first question, you know, how much do we take into account the stock market? Actually, probably these guys will probably agree, not a lot. I mean, it's kind of no guts, no glory. Unless the things are falling apart, the recession, then people everybody's back it off. But unless it looks like things are falling apart, you know, you either are an entrepreneur or you're not an entrepreneur. I guess that's the best way to put it. You are a risk taker, you're not a risk taker. But in terms of, but that said, no, we look very heavily on the marketing side. You want to make sure you've got a product that you can build, that you know what it's going to cost you to build, you know what you're going to be able to sell it for, and you know about what your absorption is going to be. Um, if you can't do that, you shouldn't be, you should, you shouldn't be risking uh, in building homes. I think marketing is very important um, for the completion of the project because as a developer you want to make sure that once you physically complete with construction, you're, se you're sold out. The carry cost afterwards becomes extremely expensive. Um, uh, right now it's becoming easier. Uh, you know, Coming out of the recession, you really needed to have a finished product. People wanted to come in and walk through a finished home. Um, there wasn't a lot of pre-sales. We actually started investing in a technology through Oculus Rift that allowed us to virtualize a finished home. Um, I, I think some of uh, people have seen that uh, technology. Um, and Oculus? Yeah, and what, what really that helped us do is, is provide a finished, completed home that's ar architecturally and design uh, accurate and allowed people to basically walk the space. And it's actually been very helpful. We've been able to pre-sell some of our existing homes right after that because people were so impressed and blown away and more importantly assured of what the space will look like, feel like that they were confident to, to you know, put in the offer and lock up the deal. Um, so I, I think marketing is always very important for, for any project. Yeah, I've actually had experience that Roman showed me. It's almost like a futuristic, you're like three-dimensional, like you're already in the house. It was really, really cool. So that was, that was, that was not, I encourage all you guys to experience it, so. Yeah, there was, there's two elements uh, in, in terms of market research. Uh, market research will give you a historic uh, account of the market conditions. They won't necessarily give you the future. Uh, most of our business has not been product uh, that we're introducing into a market that has, at a price point, that has been justified because if it was, they wouldn't need us. So usually we're always coming in at 20% above you know, the statistical data that, 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 that's in the marketplace. Contrary to that history, this is the first time in my career where we actually have MLS stats that are at or below, or uh, at or above our projected price points. And I've never seen this. Uh, so, I mean, we were talking to the lender and he was saying, well, how do you know you're going to be successful? And I said, well, look at the, look at the numbers. Here's, there's 115 sales over a million dollars in this trade area. Yeah, they're all trading at six and a quarter, 675 in that range. So if we're coming in at six, this is a home run. Uh, and I had never had that before. I'm always, you know, having to make a new market. Uh, how about yourself? Uh, we're definitely seeing new highs um, and we, um, 
and, and you nailed it too, it, it's risk. And if you understand your market and you know what you can sell this stuff for, it's not really what you think you can sell it for, what you know that your market's going to pay and then you have to deliver on that product. So the virtual renderings, a lot of attention to design, um, really goes a long way. And at the end, you're, it's still a risk, but, but here's right too, we are starting to see some closings and some comps. We had a really nice penthouse we did on Division Avenue, Division of Damon. Guy bought it from us a year ago. We were happy as hell to be selling it at $475 a foot, which was like a new high then. Um, and he just turned around and flipped it for 550 or 580 a foot, which is, it, in Wicker Park, it's like, that's never happened. So, you know, yeah, we gotta, we gotta start raising prices. We need all the brokers in the room to, to, to get their buyers up. He, he lives above me, that was Phil. I'm 2037, you at 301. I wanted to talk to you about this hot tub in the <laughs> No problem, no problem. <laughs> but uh, I got a question from the panel. Sure. As a broker who sells a lot of new construction or tries to sell a lot of mm -hmm. construction, do we all agree that you can raise your prices by at least $10,000 so when I work with buyers you can say I did something for them? <laughs> yeah, and, and oddly enough that you mentioned that we're, um, we're doing a project called the Ronsley right here in River North that um, you know we pre-sold uh, 13 units. We've got 41 total. Um, we are charging a $10,000 kind of non-refundable custom design fee. Uh, we don't really make anything on it, but it does help the buyer to understand the amount of effort and energy that goes into it, um, and we're just as happy to do that and provide that service. Um, because people, like we talked about, these days they want what they want. Um, they don't want uh, two cabinet doors and uh, you know one piece of, of green granite from that they put in the trunk or whatever, and that's like your only choice. That's going to turn people off. So that's what we're doing. Uh, what was the original question? I think we sort of branched off. What you mean, you mean what, are we, what are we offering in terms of these upper end things? Or? What are you doing to customize Well, you know, and I, as I talked before about how you know, we've gotten back to, we're a production builder. I have, we have one custom community out in Kildare, and we'll do whatever you want to do on that community, but every place else, we are a production builder. In the city, it's a little bit different. We'll do a few more things at the houses in Bridgeport, but for the most part, we won't. But you can't just say, we're production builders, so we won't make any changes, but not offer options as well. I mean, we hopefully, I think we offer lots of room options and different ways you can still kind of customize the house, not within your own mind necessarily, but hopefully all the different ways that somebody might want to live within an existing footprint. Uh, we also have put a lot of effort now, we had in the years past, into really having cutting edge uh, finishes. Uh, not just in your in, uh, up, upgrades and options, but with the included features. You know, Cosmo fireplaces, for example. You can go out and purchase uh, one of our $300,000 townhomes in the suburbs and put a Cosmo fireplace in if you want. So um, that's what we're trying to do to be able to keep things within our manageable production vein, still offer as many options and choices as we can, you know, to to still give that customizing feel to our buyers. But I do think under a certain price point, buyers aren't as insistent on being able to do whatever they want to do, and some are, and we, we deal with that. I, I think uh, offering options is a double-edged sword because if you offer too many, it becomes counterproductive, and the buyers just get too stressed out by having to make a decision. Um, what we found is that you allow them to customize within the three to five options that you've pre-selected or allow them to do that. Um, and um, our process has been really, if you buy early on and it doesn't affect our timeline and our cost and things like that, you're able to select things within the allowances we provide or outside of them, as long as they're reasonable. You know, if we have to order a kitchen today and you want to spend two weeks designing it, well, that's kind of out of the question. But if you're buying during the framing stage and you want to choose your own tiles or do some sort of special uh, carpentry or design elements, I think that's reasonable as long as it doesn't affect your schedule and your delivery. I, I think for buyers it gives them the uh, added comfort of knowing that they've personalized the space, made it their own, um, but doesn't create too much difficulty um, for, for the developer. In, in certain cases, I, I understand for Lexington Homes it becomes very difficult, especially with the scale of uh, volume that they're doing that, that becomes counterproductive. Um, one thing I would like to mention is that we're, we're actually working on a modular concept of homes uh, using a modular factor that will allow buyers to essentially customize a home within a pre-configured configuration. So let's say we have three to five uh, options for kitchen layout, living room, bathroom, um, and other spaces and you essentially choose from any of those and combine it together in a home. It's like a building a home out of Lego pieces. I think that's going to go above and beyond to allow people to 
customized homes, um, particularly single family, because single families, different families have different needs. So not one layout or not one finish uh, meets everybody. And I think in the future, I think that's going to become very, very predominant, um, especially once the city gets a little more uh, open to uh, the uh, inspection process. I'm going to ask one last two questions. I'm going to open up to the floor, guys. So uh, sales. Um, and then predictions. I want to see where you guys pull a little Nostradamus where we're going, okay? So sales, what's your philosophy about using an external sales force or like a real estate agent or internal keeping in-house? How do you guys disseminate between the two? And if you decide to go external, what are some of the things that you look for when you're looking to sell the property with a real estate professional? Uh, Double-edged sword, my wife's a real estate agent as well. But, uh, you know, we look for, we, we always go external. We, we've tried looking into you know, going in-house, but you know, there's something about A, being a part of a big firm. There's a lot of great firms out there um, you know, at properties, but you know, Coldwell and, and, and all the others, I mean, they're fantastic. We're using Dreamtown on, uh, on uh, the Ronsley Project, but it, it's really about the agents and their connections. So we're really gonna look at, you know, these agents have to know the right agents to go to, and you see the, the show's uh, Million Dollar Listing and all that, uh, that guy Frederick, Right? He's unbelievable. But look, you, you give him like a $1,500 or $3,000 per foot condo and he knows the first 10 agents to call because he knows who the buyers are. He knows who's out there and who's looking. Um, and that's basically what we do. You know, we always have given the agents that bring us deals the option to sell the deals, but we're always going to make sure that, that they have experience in the market. They know the right places to go. They know what marketing works and what doesn't so your project doesn't come off cheesy or, or you know, or, or less than than super appealing to the buyers in any way. It's the most important thing. Um, clearly, as a sales and marketing agent, uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of outsourcing. Uh, if anyone likes my cards, I have a pocket full of them today. Uh, the primary difference between our firm and, and brokerage firms is that we don't do brokerage. We do on-site sales. We do on-site advocacy. People that are working on our projects only make a living if they sell that product. So it's not about, it's really about overcoming objections and spinning the buyer's desires and wants back to the single product that they have an opportunity to make a sale at. Uh, a lot of times people will throw out, you know, uh, minor objections that the, the broker, if he, if he has an opportunity to, to make sales, he wants the buyer to buy something. It doesn't matter if it's project he's sitting or the project across the street. Uh, we had this circumstance when uh, my, my partner had the Legacy and Park Monroe, and when Ad took over the, leg took over the Legacy uh, and we opened up the second phase at Park Monroe, the people were coming from the Legacy across the street with the broker and up the stairs and we were making sales. So, I mean, I don't know if the legacy knew that, but it just happened to be, you know, the circumstances. So, that's the foundation on our side. We act as in-house people for our clients. Uh, and Jeff, I know that you're in-house, so why don't you? Yeah, I mean, that's, we've always done it that way. And even though we're, we're not doing 1,200 units a year now, we still sort of operate as, in the same fashion, sort of structured the same way. So, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna keep that in-house. Now, if we were to come across a project that were so small, it was so small, let's say we thought a 10 unit, something or other was advantageous. Maybe that's not enough to hire a person and bring them on, give them benefits and everything else to have them maybe leave after 10 units. So maybe that might be an example where a project, we might do a project that we wouldn't have because we're maybe gonna farm it out. Um, you know, we have a building that we're looking at doing uh, uh, condos on, uh, uh, on the north side. You know, if it turns out that's gonna be the only elevator building we're gonna be doing at one time, we may farm that out as opposed to bringing in a whole group just to, just to market one building. So we'll see, but for the most part, we do it ourselves. And, and uh, that's just kind of our mentality. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, th I think the sales part is a very critical part of, of uh, the project, and I think the agent component is, is also very important. Um, it, it depends on the scope of the project um, and also on the type of product. So what we're seeing and for our particular, uh, because we're essentially in, uh, created a niche market in the sustainable and, and efficiency market, and a lot of buyers don't really consider things that are what we think are very important um, in their 
buying proce uh, process. So they come in, they'll look at, you know, the finishes, the bathrooms, and, and the kitchens, and, and the flooring, but they don't really consider what's behind the walls and the mechanicals. And, and you can always change out a kitchen if you don't like it, or a bathroom, but you can't change your insulation, things like that. So I think um, the sales or the agent is very critical in that, and, and educating the consumer to really consider what's important for them long term for the buying process and really helping to push the, 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 the sales and getting you the top dollar um, and justifying that price for, for your product. Great. So last thing before we can open up, where do you guys see us going? Where is the market in the next three, five years? What are you planning for? What are you seeing? I don't know, should we have Gary answer first? <laughs> This is a, it's a tough one. I, I think that the market's going to continue for the high-end stuff. I think it's going to continue to open up on the lending side, and I think we're going to see prices go up way behind uh, New York, San Fran, and L.A., um, and there's some guys, you guys heard about that $70 million land sale, JDL wants to do 1,200 square foot uh, condos and deliver them in three years. I think he's going to do it. I think the neighborhood has been so deprived, especially some of these areas of of new product, when a buyer goes to look in, they're gonna see a six or 700 square foot, or $600 per square foot unit that they have to put 400 grand in just to bring it up to date. And I think that's going to push people into, nah, I don't wanna deal with it, I'll just pay 1100 or 1200 bucks a foot here and get what I want. You have 147 million people in housing transition. Uh, between the boomers and the, and the Gen, Gen Ys. Uh, so it's a, a, a demographic bonanza. Uh, and we have never had that before. Uh, the boomers that got trapped in their homes because of the recession uh, are now seeing price points as, that go back to 06. They're anxiously bailing out and that's what's driving the luxury product downtown. Uh, we did a study a number of years ago about uh, people moving back downtown and we found that about 85, 90% of them wanted to live in an area that they lived in in their 20s because that's what they, you know, now they're in their 60s but they want that lifestyle back. So that's what's driving the luxury market and I just think that the millennials will be right behind them. We can't get around it. There's just too many people that are in transition. Well, you know, I think we've seen uh, things converting back to a sales market in phases. Um, you know, the luxury side pretty much, you know, snap back right away. Um, you know, land for smaller parcels in the city, I think prices bubbled pretty much overnight when things started to come back three, four years ago. No, two, no, sorry, about two years ago. And, uh, um, you know, if you're going to buy a property in a city, you have to know your values and know your costs and jump on it and act quickly uh, if and when something comes, up, comes, comes along. By the same token, you know, we see activity now, sales activity happening in the South Loop. That tells me that there's, that, that's one of the best signs of all because the South Loop, which got so saturated and so overbuilt and so full of people who were now over, underwater in, their, in, their, in where they were living in their home, that to see that market start to show some life, I think is the best sign. I was at a, at a, at a, at a, at a market report uh, in December, I think it was, by John Burns, that called Chicago as one of its best, uh, they predicted Chicago to be one of the four best year after year performing markets in 2015. Now that might be because everything's relative and we're supposed to be coming from, <laughs> we're coming from a lot further distance down. Uh, we haven't seen the job growth that you know, we would like to have seen in this market. It's been mostly in the city. Now we're hearing about some job growth happening in the Naperville corridor and that'll start to help that a little bit. And, uh, but uh, um, you know, I, I think we'll see things slowly but surely come back, and some of these, uh, uh, you know, the, the mid-level markets start to come back with some volume as well. But also keep in mind, and you know, if you're a developer and you go to bed, if you don't go to bed having sleep problems every single night, then something's wrong. The second you go to bed and you're so confident everything's going to be good, is the day you wake up and the bottom drop out. What is, I heard recently a saying that if you're a developer long enough, it's like being a, a poker player in Vegas. If you stay at the table long enough, you'll end up losing all your chips. <laughs> So, and there's probably some truth to that. So, but, so that said, you know, I think most developers in this area are probably a little, uh, they're, they're cautious. I don't know that anybody's feeling that comfortable to step out and commit to anything that's more than, say, three years. Uh, so that's why you're, you're not going to see as big uh, a project as you might have seen before for a while. But, you know, I think as things continue to improve slowly, I think we want to see the rest of the world economy start to catch up. Right now, the United, our economy is the only one that's doing well. And uh, that's good news and bad news. 
I think the market in Chicago, um, we're predicting for the next two, three years to be pretty strong and uh, keep going. I think after three years, we'll have to reanalyze and see where the market conditions are at that. But um, I think we should be doing fine for that period. Uh, great. That was really great. I'm going to open it up, guys. Uh, as you guys are eating, please be open. Ask as many questions as you like. Um, it's just about uh, 127. We have about a few more minutes left. We have a private tape for you guys in the back after we're done get some food and stuff. So if you ask questions, please do so. I'm going to repeat it back just so we can get on. on, on uh, everyone can make sure we hear. Any other questions out there at all? Yes, sir. Question was land acquisitions. Uh, what type of properties they're looking at? Um, uh, yeah, we, we focus primarily in the city uh, and surrounding suburbs. But what we've seen lately is is brutal. Um, there's a lot of equity out there, and um, it, it kind of still wants to go into the real estate market, whether it's rental or condo. And you know, with the way the technology is now, everything's a whisper. It doesn't have to go on the MLS. You know, typically when we see a property and the agent comes to us and says, oh, you're the first one I'm showing this to, usually I'll get three or four calls the same day and be like, hey, you're the first one I'm showing this to. And you're gonna have six or eight developers that are, that are jumping on these properties and, and more of, of the premier land locations, um, but there's a lot more competition right now for new deals and we're seeing the land prices being driven up pretty, pretty steeply. And in the case in point is what I mentioned, the JDL deal, um, $70 million for what I think is around a 15,000 square foot power sale is, you know, but if they believe in the numbers and they know they can deliver, it's a profitable project. It's just, uh, you know, another day at the poker table. <laughs> well, it is a different, it is a different situation in suburbs and city for the most part. Um, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, you know, the municipalities are, are always a challenge, um, Chicago included. Um, there's a large national builder that is trying to come into, into Chicago right now. Um, they've had a couple people... <coughs> three or four people working to build this division and get it started, and they haven't been able to pull the trigger on any projects yet and get them opened. And I heard kind of through the grapevine that they're sort of second thinking uh, coming to Chicago, they didn't realize, they're surprised as to how long the entitlements take are taking here and, and as to how, how much brain damage you have to go through to get these things uh, done. So, you know, we, we've known about, welcome to our world, you know, we've known about this forever, and, um, and it's not getting any easier. And it is amazing when you think about it. You go, you know, one, one municipality, Versus another, how they have different viewpoints. You know, you, you know, one town brings you in, they haven't had your development in a long time, and they get you started, but then you want to get a sign, a little help with a sign that people can see, and they're out there being real persnickety, you know, and don't you understand, you know, you, don't you want us to succeed and bring tax revenue into your, into your town? So every, all towns are different, but, you know, it's always a challenge, and, um, you know, we're not going to not do a deal because it might take us a little bit longer to, to you know, to entitle it. But there, there are some points where if it becomes so, so difficult, you're going to walk away and let somebody else deal with it. But, uh, you know, and again, it, it depends on the property itself, but. Uh, I think the established markets such as Lincoln Park, Bucktown, Westtown, Roscoe Village, the competition, as Brian said, is really high. Um, as a developer, most of our profits are really tied to the land acquisition. If you can buy the land at a good price, you're kind of going to make a profit because the cost of construction is the same, it doesn't matter where you build it. Um, I think areas such as uh, Kenwood, Woodlawn, Pilsen, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, influx of development there because you can still get land relatively cheap compared to uh, the areas I mentioned and there's a higher uh, probability of growth in the land value there. So if, if, if you buy it at the right time, um, you're more likely to have a higher profit growth. Um, I think the good buy is on the borderlines of the established markets, um, just outside the border, because as is mentioned, as developers, I think we make our money on land acquisitions primarily more so than on the actual construction uh, and the building and sale. So if you're able to get the land before it appreciates, uh, there's a higher probability. It gives you also a lot more security at the risk um, because you have that positive uh, uh, rate of growth, uh, value. Gary and then Jack, Gary? I was just saying, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You, you make your money when you buy the land, you just build the house to get to it. Right. <laughs> Gary? So, you know, we were, you were talking about the importance of marketing. We were also talking about the, uh, the onslaught of the, uh, the virtual tours, the, the 3D tours. 
I'm just wondering, is there any concern, my concern, and the player feel the same one, is that the 3D tour is going to get people to like not come in and look at the product in reality, and that you're not going to have an opportunity to meet the buyer and talk to them, or walk them through the property and put your spin on it. This question was, actually 3D, that's going to be for you, Dan, for specifically. Will the 3D virtual tour actually prevent buyers from coming in physically seeing the property? What we're seeing is that the 3D tour is a supplement. Um, you actually get the buyers in the door first, they see the space, and then you use the 3D tour to really solidify their impression and um, increase their confidence in purchasing the property because for, for, for buyers, a lot of times it's hard to imagine if you're walking through a frame space what it will look like finished. And, you know, is it going to be nice what the finishes will look like? You don't get to touch, feel, and see that. So walk in the space and then following up with a virtual tour really is really helpful because one, they get a physical sense for the space, but then afterwards they get a sense of what it will look like finished. And what we saw is that it's, it's, it's been helpful. I mean, we've pre-sold our Damon project. We actually sold the first two units before we broke ground just on the virtual models alone. Um, and on our Western project as well, it, Essentially, after we did the tour, the next day we had an offer. So we're finding that it's very valuable. Um, visualization in general is very important for marketing. People want to see what it's going to look like, you know, the finishes, and to, to really put them in ease of, you know, putting up a significant portion of the money. And in certain cases, sometimes non-refundable if they're going to customize it. Yeah, I'm going to add something to, the, to your point. Um, you know, the internet has been both a great thing and a terrible thing for marketeers like us because. You know, you, when somebody comes in, if you're in a pre-sale, then these 3D uh, tools can help you greatly to try and make something more tangible. But before the internet, before all these electronic and digital things existed, um, we wouldn't even send, if somebody were to call one of our subdivisions and ask us to send them a, 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 a brochure, we wouldn't send it to them unless they were out of the metropolitan area. We, because that, just to your point, that took away their, their motivation to come in and see the community. And you know that if they only judge you based on a price and a two-dimensional you know, drawing, they go see some other builder. Well, he's always, and they actually see his models. He's going to look better, for sure. But if they actually saw him both apples to apples, they may realize that he's got a lot more wasted space and it's not as good of a value versus ours as it, as it, as it looked. So yes, it's a double-edged sword putting all this stuff out there. I hate having to put square footage out there and pricing and have, have so much info before I can bring him in and sit him down and really you know, uh, go through the process with them. But it is what it is, and, and so you try, to, you, know, you try to balance what you put out there. You don't want to put out too much, but you know, at the end of the day, you do have enough out there that they, they have less reason to come see you sometimes. It's, it's, a, bal it's a balancing act. Right. Yeah. Uh, ideally, if you can, if you can stick build, you know, we've done high rises where we stick built models inside of, of trailers. Uh, and you know, when we were launching you know, high rise after high rise, it was costing us somewhere between four to six hundred thousand dollars to put the show on. Uh, the um, today, you know, we need the pre-sales uh, because the lenders aren't moving forward without the pre-sales. But uh, in terms of marketing, the one takeaway that I had from Vegas this year was it's all about mobile. Uh, the smartphone is six years old. They've sold 550 million of them. Uh, I've got kids in their 20s who will sit in my family room and they'll text each other across the couch. It's unbelievable. And if you're not, if your site isn't mobile, if you're not mobile, then you're going to be left behind. 85% of all home searches uh, are now going mobile versus desktop. So make sure that you're, that you're up to speed with that. And what to show and not to show. And what, yeah, exactly. Certain things you show on a small screen, they're going to hurt you. Yeah. I mean, it really is a, is a, it's a, I think we're still learning where that's going to go. Yeah. Would you like, would you like to? Uh, short one. I, I mean, it, they're all tools, as, as Dan said, is, is perfectly accurate. But for now, nothing can replace that uh, connection. The, the presentation, the person to person, show, touch, feel, finishes. Um, reputation is incredibly important, but that personal connection because somebody's buying not just a product, but in many cases a relationship. They're buying a dream. Buying a dream. Yeah. yeah I love it. JV, Jeff? Yeah. What kind of uh, target IRRs are you guys underwriting your projects at, both for like uh, common developments and single family homes? And then the second part of the question would be are you guys, you know, each of you respectively, using all principal based capital for your equity, or are you guys bringing in outside investors? How are you structuring 
So the question was, what type of IRR model are you guys following? And then as far as the equity position, is it? Um, I see. Yeah, private equity or? Yeah, that's a dangerous question to answer. That's a very dangerous question to answer, right? Um, and, and the easy way out of it is, is and I know Gary's to say this, it depends. Um, you know, you have big institutional money that can live with a very low return because where else are they going to put their you know, billions of dollars of, of free capital? They can't risk it all in the stock market, um, and they can't really put it all in a 0.2% in a CD or money market or whatever. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, you know, I think you're going to see on, on apartment projects as low as like 12%, 10 to 12% IRs. There still has to be a premium because it's a little more risky to do real estate. Um, for sale product, you know, people shoot for, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and it's a, it's a crapshoot. You know, you, you, if you sell a house in two years versus one year, <clears throat> your return may be the same, but the IRR is half. So um, there's just a ton of variability. And the equity is going to be coming from us uh, to inspire confidence in the deals. But, you know, we also use a lot of outside equity as well. Um, and it just depends, again, on the project, how big it is, how much risk we want to take, how much risk they want to take. Um, you know, so it's all over the board. Yeah. Most of the deals that we've been working with are 18 to 22. Uh, seems to be a sweet spot. If they can get out of there with 15 to 12, they're, they're ecstatic. Uh, most all of our sponsors, almost all our clients have to come up with at least 10% uh, of the equity raise and, and do. Uh, the IRRs on the MES is 20, 22, uh, you know, and equity a little bit less. But, you know, everyone's, it's, it's back to the times where, you know, it, it was, everyone's getting greedy again, especially the money. Right. And we've done it both ways. You know, I mean, uh, with the smaller projects we've been doing, we've been financing them. We've been doing, coming up with the equity ourselves for the most part. We've had equity partners at Concord. We had one equity partner the whole time who handled all the equity and was kind of a ongoing, it was a great relationship. But those, you know, it's such a different time today. Um, answer your question about the IRR, I mean, we don't generally have the target like we used to. I'd say 15 is probably the low you want to end up being, uh, you start with. end up at, right, right, at the minimum. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, as, as projects get bigger, we will look to other, you know, other entities for equity lending. But, you know, at this point, we've just been, for the most part, doing ours. We, but we've done it both ways, and we're amenable that we're doing it both ways. I would also say it really depends on the project. I think the larger projects you can expect a, uh, a lower rate of return on the smaller ones and also on the timing. Uh, for single families, the, I think it's an inverse relationship. Your IRR is a little higher just because you can be in and out. In an ideal situation, maybe six, seven months if everything lines out perfectly. Um, on the larger projects, you know, they're 18 months or, or to 24, though, those are a little lower. I think what we've, we've been seeing on average between 20 to 30 percent, but we're in, a, I think, uh, a smaller market segment than some of, uh, like, for instance, Lexington Homes. Um, so we're able to capitalize a little better, but we, uh, on the volume scale, we're much smaller. Any questions? Yes, sir. I think most of them are still happening. A lot of them are. The question was alderman. That's what the alderman is. And rezoning effect. A lot of these areas are still are doing runoffs, you know, so we don't know yet. Uh, it really does depend on the alderman. Some of them are more pro development, some of them are just completely outrageously, sure. stupidly anti development for, for really no logical reason. Um, but I think the problem with us has been. You know, the problem they're all having is the entitlement process is uh, seemingly getting worse. The city's getting very busy, and um, these aldermen are deferring a lot to the neighborhood groups. The people that volunteer for these groups may be a five-person committee that's not really representative of the actual neighborhood, and the people that you kind of want there really are busy working, and they don't really have the time to, to, to take to, to weigh in on what they think would be more logical as a growth point for the neighborhood. So, um, I think it's just as tough as it's ever been. Um, we're going to see some shifts in, in some new aldermen, maybe tougher in certain areas, maybe not. 
Um, but th that's pretty much what's happening. It's, it's kind of more of the same thing. It depends who has a big, winning the mayor, too. I mean, that, that's a big uh, up in the air thing right now. There's been a major push for the TOD, which is Transit Oriented Development yeah. Incentives, and we love that. That's geared towards millennials. It basically says that anywhere within 600, 1200 feet of an L stop or Metra, um, any type of good public tra transportation, they're encouraging higher density, they're encouraging a lower parking ratio just because that demographic actually does tend to drive less. Millennials, a lot of them are, they want to live closer to work, so you know, on the average in the city, 70% of everybody has a car, but on the average of the millennials, it's really about 30% of these people, of these kids, um, you know, 24 to 33 or 35 years old, have a car and, and need a place to park it. So they're trying to encourage that, and I think you're gonna see a lot of developments in those types of areas. Wow, wow, that's great information. Any other question, guys, at all? Well, we really appreciate it, Brian, Gary, Jeff, and Dan, this was great. Um, guys, make sure you, you, you thank them. Uh, what we have on deck for next month is a really well-known residential real estate appraiser, our underwriter, and a condo uh, person at Pearl that's gonna come out. Uh, and then the month after that, we have a negotiation expert come in. We're trying to uh, finalize one from Northwestern. That'll be great, you guys will all be invited to that as well. Um, we passed out these little surveys. Give us your feedback, what you think. Hope you guys enjoyed the food. Make sure you take care of the valet guys, please. Um, always got to take care of the, the guys that are hustling in the streets. So this was great. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I hope you guys found this valuable as well. Um, we have some, some food for you guys in the back. Make sure you guys grub a little bit if you can have some time. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.